your video on or off. Um, if you have a question, I will take questions at the end. And um, if you're having any trouble hearing me, please alert me, you know, during the presentation so that I can try to remedy the issue. Hopefully this will go off without a hitch and we won't have any technological issues. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my PowerPoint with you because that's what I have today. And <clears throat> All right, everyone, that should be up now. We're good, LaShawn? All right, thanks, Jude, appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I'm Emily Kohler. I have a bachelor's in health science from the University of North Florida. After that, I went on and to TCC and um, got my registered dental hygiene uh, degree. And then I became a certified tobacco treatment specialist. So today what we'll cover is uh, tobacco use, the tactics of the tobacco industry, so the targeting and marketing that they do to certain individuals. Are you advancing this? I'm, just, no, ma'am, I'm not touching anything. Yeah, me neither, and it just advanced itself, so I don't know if it's somehow set on a timer, but in all of my practice, it was not set on a timer, so that's interesting. Okay, so um, we're also cover costs of tobacco use, the adverse health effects, and the addiction pathway in the brain. So you can maybe develop a little more empathy for these folks uh, when they're struggling with quitting, the benefits of quitting tobacco, and then all the resources available to clients that you may have access to helping. Okay, so we'll start off with some statistics. And the latest data we have is from 2018. Um, in the U.S. for adult tobacco use, we're just under 14 percent. We've come a very long way. We're down from almost 21 percent in 2005, and 14 percent might sound quite low, but remember that that's still over 34 million Americans, and that is a lot of people, and we can see that uh, by gender, our males use more than females, and then by age range, the population that is using uh, with the highest prevalence is ages 25 to 64 years old. And again, this is traditional tobacco, and we're going to talk about that only today because you may start to think about electronic cigarettes as I talk through this. That in and of itself is a whole other very long discussion, and we could do another training on that topic. I'll take a few questions at the end if you have some specifically, but as we move forward, uh, we'll see that there's an inverse relationship by education. So higher education, less likely to have tobacco use, lower education, uh, more likely to use tobacco. And then the population with the highest tobacco use rate is going to be those with a, uh, their GED. <clears throat> And we'll also see that the industry targets those in poverty and they do it really well. So there's such a disparity and we have, you know, over 25 or 26 percent of those living in poverty who are using tobacco, which as we just saw, the national average being just under 14 and then the low income population uh, smoking at a much higher rate, more than 10 percent higher rate. And then there's a breakdown I left uh, several years back up here to show by racial or ethnic group. And basically it goes in line with the tallest box over the individual's head is the highest uh, tobacco use in that population. And on down the line to Asian have the lowest use. And you'll see that it's been pretty close uh, run for white and African-American population over the years. But it's important to note that um, Afri African Americans are disproportionately affected. They're more likely to die from their tobacco use. They actually want to quit at higher rates than their white counterpart, um, but they don't, they have less trust in the system to actually seek and access the help. So we want to try to break down those barriers and bring help to anyone trying to quit and not leave out any group. So let's look at some of the tactics of the industry. And we'll start with the rural populations because Bigman AHEC serves very rural counties. And I will show you exactly which ones uh, before the presentation's over. But smokers living in rural areas are more likely to smoke three quarters of a pack of cigarettes or more per day. So one pack of cigarettes has 20 cigarettes in there just to um, orient you to that. Adolescents in rural regions begin smoking cigarettes much earlier in life. Daily smoking is more likely in rural areas, and people in rural areas have 18 to 20 percent higher rates of lung cancer. 
I'm going to show you a few of the advertisement, advertisement and um, tactics that they have. So here, obviously, they're targeting a rural area. They have a cowboy image. Um, you know, to some, he would look cool. He's out in the wilderness riding on a horse, and it says, I never walk when I can ride, and I never ride without my coat. And in this case, he's talking about smokeless tobacco, which is much more common in rural areas. And he's got actually the can of dip right in his hands to uh, promote the product. And then, of course, it was the Marlboro Cowboy image as well for the cigarettes. Um, and in 2016, cigarette and smokeless tobacco companies spent over $9 billion on advertising and promotional expenses in the U.S. alone. So they uh, have very deep pockets to promote these products. And what that amounts to is more than $26 million every single day, more than $29 for every single person, including your children. So they're targeting our youth. Uh, no name in their game, do something called point of sale, and I'll show you an image later of what I mean about point of sale. It's about the image of where the child can see the advertisements in the convenience stores. And then more than $250 a day for each U.S. adult smoker they're spending. So um, really no group is left out. They target our military, our veterans, and they smoke at a rate of almost 22%. And that number jumps very significantly with the age group um, of 18 to 25, up to 50% of them smoking. Um, and I get this a lot in class, you know, pretty much all of my veterans, and they say that they began smoking. Uh, they're mostly older population that come to class, and they got it in their ration, and that's how they became addicted to the product, kind of gave them something to do while they were sort of in between and in downtime and a it's traditionally known as a social thing to do, so that camaraderie as well <clears throat> among the, the military and the veterans. So uh, more marketing for years, big tobacco has targeted the African-American, LGBTQ, people of lower socioeconomic status, and persons with mental illness. For all of those groups, the tobacco use rate is higher. And you'll see these two statistics off to the right. Individuals with mental illness account for 46% of cigarettes sold in the U.S. That is astronomically high. And I think that with people with uh, mental health represent somewhere between 20 and 25% of the population. So for the fact that they represent almost half of all cigarettes sold is really profound. And then LGBTQ uh, young adults 18 to 24 are nearly twice as likely to use tobacco. Uh, against their uh, straight counterparts or peers. So industry targeting and marketing towards African Americans, the industry's attempts to maintain positive image among um, African Americans have included efforts in supporting cultural events and making contributions to minority higher education institutions, elected officials, civic and community organizations, and different scholarship programs. Their strategies listed below in bullet points are campaigns using urban culture and language to help promote menthol cigarettes and specifically we'll talk about why that is such a problem when they're promoting menthol to certain populations. And then the tobacco sponsored hip hop bar nights where they would give out free samples and they do this tactic as well at like rodeos for rural communities. And then direct mail promotions for tobacco products and then other culturally tailored advertising and messages and imaging. So the companies have historically placed more ads in African-American publications, which expose them to more cigarette ads than whites. And back in 2011, a review concluded that Ebony Magazine was 10 times more likely than People Magazine to contain advertisement for menthol cigarettes specifically again. And you can see these three uh, advertisements, two of the three are promoting Cool, which is a menthol cigarette. And although it's not as popular as it once was, you'll see uh, probably more Newport ads now, but Salem was kind of one of the, the OG um, of menthol cigarettes and then Cool kind of came on the scene and now it's Newport. <clears throat> and then you have in the, in the middle image, there is an e-cigarette ad actually. And that guy looks so professional, cool. He's got his nice top hat on and it makes it look like, wow, I wanna look like that guy. I wanna be like him. Here are some of the long-term advertisements that have been going on for years targeting uh, African-American with menthol. And 
And really why this is an issue is because it soothes the throat. It acts like an anesthetic. It makes it easier to uh, take a drag of the cigarette and get the smoke deeper into the lungs. They're getting more nicotine more effectively distributed into the lungs and the bloodstream and acting on the brain. So they can smoke fewer cigarettes and still have a very severe impact of nicotine addiction uh, with menthol cigarettes. And uh, nearly nine of every 10 African-American smokers aged 12 years and older prefer menthol. I ask every single person in any class I've ever taught for cessation. And um, I find that this statistic rings true for me anecdotally as well. So menthol in the cigarettes, again, is more harmful because the chemicals are more, chemicals are more easily absorbed into the body. And <clears throat> again, that makes it easier to smoke and harder to quit. So here, um, research shows that more tobacco retailers exist in areas with African-American, Hispanic, and low-income populations. And I do have video links here throughout the presentation, but I've been testing them and they're lagging too much. So to improve your experience as a viewer, I'm not going to play them, but if you want the PowerPoint, we can share them. They're, um, you, you can just Google truth and they have all types of um, neat like anti-tobacco advertising and displaying what the industry is doing for uh, profiling, marketing, and targeting populations. Again, here you can see, excuse me, there are up to 10 times more tobacco ads in black neighborhoods than in other neighborhoods. Also more tobacco retailers near schools in low-income neighborhoods. Now we have put some policies in place to try to limit that. Uh, like maybe a hundred yards from a school, there can't be a tobacco retailer, but um, not all counties have done this effectively, but it's something that you can get on your local tobacco free partnerships and help promote these types of policies to help keep the children safe. And you can see on the bottom, these are some of the different advertisements that they would have. And when you're in a low income neighborhood, you better believe they're gonna have as many on the right plastered all over the place. And then they'll also, um, target with like more menthol ads to in black neighborhoods. And then you can see the image on the bottom left. There's a young boy noticing like, oh, what's that interesting camel? Well, they're promoting camel cigarettes right there. And it's no um, mistake that it is at closer to his eye level than an adult's eye level. And the same goes for where they place them on the windows. They're never going to be high up on the windows. They're always low. Um, to what would be like sort of our stomach level so that it's at a youth's eye level and they can see this. And again, that's called point of sale. And you can learn more about that if you join any of your local Tobacco Free Leon or if you're not in Leon County, you have a Tobacco Free partnership in every county. It's affiliated with Department of Health. So I just included this as we lead into employment. I like this ad because they're targeting that vulnerable population, African American and Latino, so minority groups that the industry targets to put more tobacco products, they're having a counter ad here from um, the FDA. And this is a CEO of an organization and it says like, you know, don't smoke, it's not cool. You can't get where I am if you are smoking kind of message that it delivers. <clears throat> And we can see that it costs a lot of money to smoke for the economy, the individual, and the smoking related illness costs our nation just in the US $183 billion. In Florida, that was annual direct costs to the economy attributable to smoking were in excess of over $19.5 billion, workplace productivity losses over four and almost four and a half billion, and then premature death losses of almost $8 billion. And then the average price of a pack of cigarettes is $5.50. And when we're targeting low income, that represents a lot of money for that individual that could be spent elsewhere. So if that individual is smoking a pack a day, they're spending over $2,000 to something that is, when used as directed, harming them. <clears throat> so what does it cost an employer? Uh, if you're running a business, it can be very costly to employ smokers. And in fact, you can directly discriminate against smokers for the fact that if, if they are a smoker, you cannot hire them and they can legally do this. 
Um, so this could disproportionately affect, you know, those already vulnerable populations. But healthcare costs for employees who smoke are up to 34% higher than those who don't use tobacco. So that alone is just a business decision of do I want to employ someone that's going to cost me 34% more or not. And for an employer, insuring someone who smokes costs 2000 more dollars every year than insuring a non-smoker. And then losses in productivity and healthcare costs. Uh, on an employee who smokes could cost that business an additional 6000 So that typical um, cost would rack up an additional 16000 in lifetime medical bills too. This blew my mind when I read this. So employees who take four just 10 minute smoke breaks a day work an entire month less per year than workers who do not smoke or do not take those four 10 minute breaks a day. And when I thought, no, that can't be true. I'm thinking of like, Oh, the times you stop to have a conversation with someone in the workplace or you run off to the bathroom or have a snack or something like that. But to add this up, of course, in this light, it's targeting, you know, how much money it costs for the smoker. But it was just mind blowing for me. Smokers have twice as many absences as well, um, generally to health you know, complications. And one study found that, uh, more than 14,000 work of more than 14,000 workers in Sweden found smokers took an average of 11 more sick days. So again, this is not to attack the smoker. This is just to show a, a business kind of why they would make the decisions they make on hiring or not hiring tobacco users. And if you are a tobacco user, you can kind of see where they're coming from and say, man, maybe it's time I consider quitting so that I don't get discriminated against solely for that. And we all need jobs <laughs> to pay our bills. So what is the burden of tobacco use? It is the greatest cause of preventable disease and premature death in the US. 50% of all smokers are gonna die prematurely from a smoking related disease by an average of 14 years. And then this is a really profound um, grouping of statistics, but it kills more people than alcohol, AIDS, car accidents, uh, illegal drugs, murders, and suicides combined. So um, we'll see here that almost half a million people die prematurely from smoking or exposure to secondhand smoke. So you don't always die, you know, many survive, but more than 16 million Americans live with a smoking related disease that impacts their quality of life um, over, you know, just quantity. So approximately 3,000 children and adolescents still start smoking daily. And now, of course, we have the issue of them beginning uh, to become addicted to nicotine due to introduction through electronic cigarettes. And they're more likely to uh, become traditional cigarette smokers if they are exposed to any form of nicotine, which is in the electronic cigarette. So what's a traditional cigarette smoke? There are over 7,000 chemicals and compounds in a lit cigarette. And many of these are um, known toxins and up to as many as 80 of them are known carcinogens, which means that they stimulate cancer cell growth. <clears throat> and one of the uh, byproducts that occurs when you light um, and burn the tobacco is carbon monoxide or CO, that stands for carbon monoxide. And when it's inhaled, it takes the place of oxygen in your red blood cell or hemoglobin. And um, so it has a stronger affinity for the red blood cells. Just think of it like this, that red blood cell should be tanking oxygen around the body to get every organ and cell the, the vital nutrient of oxygen that it needs to thrive and survive. And when you smoke, you uh, impact that by, it's now taking a poisonous gas around the body, carbon monoxide, and depleting all the cells and organs of the necessary oxygen. So what happens is the body compensates, your heart rate will speed up because it needs to pump the blood and oxygen to the cells. So it just has to work a lot harder to make this happen. And that just sort of explains this in particular is one of the things that impacts pretty much everything health related or negatively impacted by smoking is a lot of it comes from the carbon monoxide alone. And we do test this in class. We have a machine that looks like a little breathalyzer that the um, participants were blowing when they come to an in-person class. And um, a normal carbon monoxide reading would be six parts per million or lower. And my pack a day smokers are have they blow a wide range, um, but generally you'll see somewhere between 15 and 45. 
and that has a lot to do with you know the size of the individual did they just smoke before they came to class and blew into the machine how many cigarettes per day really is someone smoking and then metabolization rate is different for each individual because of lung size male female body weight a lot of different factors but at 20 parts per million of carbon monoxide there will be a loss of oxygen to the vital organs like brain heart kidneys etc and then when you get up in the 60 part per million range we're going to start seeing headaches nausea um, dysfunction of the central nervous system maybe even vision impairment and i have seen someone blow um, up as high as an 84 into our carbon monoxide reader so they probably don't feel very great on a regular basis and just because they've been doing it for so long living in that discomfort is their norm and um when they quit they really start to notice my gosh i didn't even realize how bad i felt until i quit <clears throat> um so this is a page directly out of our cessation curriculum and the book is called tools to quit but this shows kind of there's really nothing unaffected by tobacco use from head to toe uh, and it's not to say that these things will certainly happen to a tobacco user but there's a correlation and a higher risk if you are using tobacco and if it's something we can prevent then we want to be able to help these individuals avoid these chronic illnesses really but i'll focus today on the two most impacted um, organs in the body which is going to be the heart and lungs so when we look at lung function, um, in this image is really startling alone because of the, the color difference. But I always ask individuals in class, this picture is in our book as well, you know, what else do you notice? And here, um, I can give you a second to think of it in your head or you can blurt it out if you're, if you're off of mute. But there's one other thing I like for people to notice in this image besides the color difference. And I was just giving you a second. But you notice that thing in the center of the lungs, that's actually the heart. And look at the size difference in the smoker versus the non-smoker. And again, this goes back to that. Yes, sir, Jude, did you have it's a question? It's enlarged in the smoker because it has to right. work harder to put out more blood because the blood does not carry the normal amount of oxygen, say, as a non-smoker. Jude, you nailed it. That's exactly it. So when we talked about carbon monoxide that replaces the oxygen, I said the heart has to speed up and work a lot harder to pump the blood. So it's not only having to work harder to get oxygenated blood throughout the body, but something else happens and it's called vasoconstriction and nicotine causes this. That means your blood vessels, they become more narrow and it's harder to get the blood through. So it also increases blood pressure and this is going to put an excess stress on the heart. That's right. It's a muscle, so it enlarges. And you might think, oh, enlarging my muscles is a good thing. But in this case, it's not. Thickening and enlarging the heart wall and muscle is um, going to put you at risk for heart attack. And um, do we have a question? Sorry. Okay, so the chronic bronchitis and emphysema impacts the lungs. Let's talk a little bit more about this. So when we see um, emphysema, it's on the left and then chronic bronchitis is an image on the right. So in emphysema, the chemicals break down the walls of the alveoli or little air sacs. That's the thing that looks like a bunch of grapes. And in emphysema, emphysema they become uh, less elastic, so they don't expand and contract like they should, and this makes it more difficult to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide, or CO2. And this can feel a bit like someone, if you've seen that commercial for Advair, where they uh, take for when they have COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the commercial has an elephant sitting on the individual's chest, and that, that's what it can feel like to people who have um, emphysema or bronchitis. So in bronchitis, what happens, itis means inflammation. So they have inflammation of the bronchial tubes and there's excess mucus production and that can make it feel like uh, more like suffocation because the mucus is blocking the pathways and it makes you cough a lot, a lot of phlegm production that they're coughing out when they're having a chronic episode of, of bronchitis. Um, and then, of course, it increases the risk for lung cancer. There's a very high correlation with tobacco use. And 
lung cancer incidence. So in the US, 80 to 90% of lung cancer cases are due to smoking. That's a very high correlation. That tells me that if we could you know, end smoking, that would be fantastic because we would almost eradicate lung cancer, meaning almost get rid of it. And for me, this was a shocking thing to learn that the leading cancer killer in men and women was actually lung cancer because you don't hear about that very often, uh, but it is the leading cancer killer for both of those genders. And then, so we know that it can harm the lungs, but what are some of the signs and symptoms? And I know this is a little medical if, if you're not a clinician, but basically I just wanted you to see the images more than all the words on here. You can see the, from doing this when you hit it repeatedly, makes all of these muscles sometimes um, more visible and it can cause the chest to become barreled from the way they're breathing. But the thing that I was actually seeing the most uh, in class and noticing over time before I was actually taught it was the clubbing of the fingernails that you see on the image on the right, the curving and widening of that nail. And that's due to oxygen deprivation um, chronically happening and that's called hypoxia or chronic hypoxia, but that they're not getting the oxygen they need to uh, everything in the body. So the fingers just start to develop the clubbing. This also happens in people with cystic fibrosis. So it's not always a smoker. <clears throat> and then of course we said that it can impact the heart. We already talked about enlarging it. And they're two to four times more likely to develop heart disease if they are a smoker. All right, so let's move on to secondhand smoke. These people who don't smoke but are impacted by others who smoke in, or in the home or around them in public, uh, which we put a lot of policies in place again to try to prevent this. But in adults, it accounts for 34,000 deaths per year, heart disease, um, and lung cancer, another 7,000 deaths per year. And again, this is secondhand smoke. So people who are not smoking, they just live with another smoker or around another smoker. And then it increased the risk of stroke still. And then for children, sadly, it increases the number of ear infections that they have, and they're going to have um, more likely to have asthma and have asthma attacks and then respiratory symptoms like upper respiratory infections where they have coughing, sneezing, shortness of breath, bronchitis, and even pneumonia. So as someone who doesn't have a choice, and I was talking with LaShawn right at the beginning about people, you know, seeing people smoking in the car with youth, and they have put a policy in place to um, where they can't take it, uh, the adult for that if they're smoking with someone 14 or younger in the car. Many states have passed that policy. So secondhand smoke in um, public housing. So they actually banned in uh, the summer of 2018 smoking in public housing and they are 100% smoke free to reduce the exposure to secondhand smoke of wafting through the hallways um, and stairwells within the buildings. So we know all of this and the harm that it can do. And you might be thinking, gosh, if I knew that it did all this harm or someone knows that, why would they still smoke? How could they do this knowing the harm that it's doing? Well, yes. it's because of addiction. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jude. You answer. Uh, I've heard it hits the dopamine, the pleasure reward center in the brain in a manner similar to, say, heroin or cocaine. That yes. you get a high when you have the cigarette, the nicotine gets to the brain, you get the dopamine and you get a rush. Well, that's how I've been told. Yep. Yes, that's, that's correct. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter and it actually releases several others, but dopamine is the primary reward chemical that the nicotine causes release of through some fancy things like synapses happening in the brain. But within 10 seconds of taking a puff of a cigarette, the uh, chemicals get into your bloodstream and cross what's called the blood-brain barrier, releasing dopamine as well as serotonin, um, norepinephrine, GABA, all these other chemicals that become all these fancy words. But basically what they do is they control a lot of different things about your, your mood and your sense of joy and elation and um, relaxation, even reducing tension in the body temporarily. Um, but I won't say that it necessarily reduces anxiety because although it temporarily does, in the end, it actually can increase the symptoms of anxiety because it causes you, when you are addicted to nicotine, to go into a withdrawal state. And every time you smoke, 
you're going to have that release of chemicals and then the crash where you drop way below baseline and you crave this nicotine and you actually can become more anxious, more tense, more nervous, uh, less relaxed, you know, all the opposite effect of what you want from smoking. So, and this is very cyclical and a smoker is going through this many times a day, every time they smoke this, this rise and fall from this. And it's really just a, a cycle that they're unfortunately pretty chained to, and it is highly addictive. He is right about, it's been proven to be as addictive as cocaine um, and heroin. So <clears throat> just less directly debilitating. So, um, and not an illicit drug either. So it's sold on every corner, everywhere, um, freely, even though it does a lot of harm that it does. So let's stop on all the negative aspects of it because you pretty much know those things. I just want to explain a few more in depth. We'll get into the benefits that uh, when an individual quits, this is a page right out of our book in two to three months, your risk of heart attack begins to drop and lung function begins to improve. So shortness of breath um, is fading away. In, in less than nine months, you can exercise more easily. You can get out. I have had individuals who literally are short of breath walk into the mailbox um, and back. So I can think of one woman in particular who came to class and she was actually having to use a nebulizer breathing treatment. She was an older woman in her 70s. And um, when she left class, she was so short of breath. I came outside packing my stuff in my car. She was doubled over on her steer steering wheel, steering wheel, I'm sorry. And it just terrified me to see, gosh, this is her norm. She was like, and no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I don't need it. I'm like, should I call an ambulance? I'm, this is not the norm for me. But that was literally her everyday experience. And that just scared me to death to see that and it was sad and that just displays the nature of the addiction with nicotine. But at a year of being quit, the heart attack risk drops sharply. Two to five years stroke risk is reduced to that of non-smokers already in five years of being quit. And your chance of cancer, the mouth, throat, esophagus, and bladder is already cut in half at five years. And in 10 years, the lung cancer death rate is about half that of a smoker and the risk of cancers of uh, other organs are gonna decrease as well. And then 15 years of being quit, your risk of heart disease is that of a non-smoker. So a lot of wonderful benefits. It's really never too late to quit. I would always encourage someone, no matter what age they are, um, to go ahead and take the plunge, make the effort and get the support. So how and where are they gonna get the support from? Uh, in Florida, there are endless resources, really. Tobacco-Free Florida is, um, a wonderful resource and they have multiple programs. I'll explain, you know, the ones that we run in depth and I can answer any other questions about the other programs. But so they got a lot of different services and actually different companies run these different services. So they're kind of like Tobacco Free Florida is really more the marketing and the, the big picture of it. And then they've got organizations like Big Bend AHEC who run some of the groups. Um, but they've got Phone Quit who is run by a company called Optum and Optum also does web quit. So that's like counseling just over the phone or on the internet, and that's a great resource. And then we'll go into group quit here in just a moment because that's what AHEX do. What is group quit? What is this term? So what it is, is originally face-to-face -face group counseling sessions. Of course, we've had some changes because of COVID. So we typically do face-to-face -face group classes and nicotine replacement therapy is completely free provided to the individuals who attend the program. So that's a really big incentive to try to get people to come to this. These are evidence-based programs that we do. We have a couple of different curriculums that we use and one is tools to quit. That's a two hour, we just meet once and go through an entire curriculum that actually was formulated out of the flagship program, which is quit smoking now. That's a six or now four week, one hour per week we meet but again, the tools to quit condenses that. So a lot of people choose that in our rural areas just because they don't have the means to go back and forth four or six different times. Now, the virtual platform is going to make that um, another accessible option, which I'm really excited about. And then we have a journeys program. It's called journeys for behavioral health populations. So we do this in um, mental health settings or recovery settings like substance abuse facilities that are helping people recover from um, substance or alcohol abuse. So 
uh, assistance with quit plans. We're going to provide that throughout their program and then helping them with uh, not relapsing by continuing to support and provide more replacement therapy and attend in a second class additional counseling. So what is new with group quit is um, in, the, in the wake of COVID, it, it can't be any better time in their life to quit tobacco than now because this disease specifically or virus specifically attacks the lungs, um, as does smoking, one of the primary organs it impacts. So we uh, were permitted by the Bureau of Tobacco Free Florida to do virtual tobacco cessation classes on Zoom. And um, they've actually, the Bureau of the Health Department has allowed us to transition all of our programs like diabetes education empowerment program and our opioid education programs to Zoom as well. So this has been a wonderful platform for us. So we register our clients for the tobacco cessation classes in advance. We mail them their course book that they will follow along as if we were sitting face to face with one another. They are looking at the book, looking at us. We have the ability to share a digital book, but I prefer to look at them and see their faces and look them in the eye and, and treat it like I'm talking to them in person. Um, after they've attended the class and, and they've got, you know, join on the link as you join this today, we mail them the nicotine replacement therapy right to their house. So they can do all this from the comfort of their home. So it's a really nice alternative to the in-person classes. It's not a entire substitute. We will continue to do in-person when it becomes safe, but this would just be a nice alternative for those who can't travel or don't want to be with other people necessarily. So how does AHEC work with Tobacco Free Florida? This gets confusing for people, so I wanted to display exactly how we are a partner. So Tobacco Free Florida refers to us as Tobacco Free Florida AHEC Cessation Program. And AHEC stands for Area Health Education Center. And Tobacco Free Florida contracts directly with the Colleges of Medicine in Florida. And then those Colleges of Medicine AHECs subcontract to centers. So Big Ben AHEC is the center and our program office is the UF AHEC College of Medicine. So we report back to them and you can see that this is actually available in the entire state of Florida. All 67 counties have an AHEC that does a class and there is a class in every single county um, offered to people and now they're offered virtually as well. So Big Ben AHEC, our program we have counselors on staff, everyone's trained, um, tobacco treatment specialists and some certified tobacco treatment specialists which just means additional training. Um, how are we doing on time? Okay, good. Um, and then we serve the specific 14 counties listed in the image below. So 12 of those 14 are incredibly rural counties in Florida. So we provide the free group quit again. We're synonymous with group quit uh, from Tobacco Free Florida. We do this free for employers, for community members, anyone who wants the program. We'll set up a private class for their company. We'll set up public class for any individuals to join. And again, we give the nicotine replacement therapies for free. 18 and older, of course, for uh, nicotine replacement therapy. It's over the counter, but they still have to be an adult to be able to sign and say, yes, I can take this product from you. Uh, these are the three different products we give. So the patches in steps one, two, and three to help them um, you know, ease off of the nicotine, which is an evidence-based practice. And it gives the highest success rate when you use medication and counseling. You can see that we also do the gum um, in these, we go with name brand, although it's not necessary, but sometimes when someone just believes that that product works better, they have an even higher success rate. So that is what we use, although we don't have to. And then we do the lozenge as well, which the gum and lozenge come in two and four milligrams. And that, that has to do with if someone smokes in the first 30 minutes of waking up, then they need a higher dose because they have a higher dependence on the product. It also has to do with uh, what quantity of cigarettes they smoke on a daily basis. And that helps us determine which patch we should start them on. But you know, if you have more questions about that, I'm happy to answer, but I don't think it's necessary for me to share a whole lot more about that with you here. Um, so Tobacco Free Florida AHEC cessation program client eligibility. Who, who can do this? There must be a catch, right? There's a limitation. No, there's not a limitation. It doesn't matter if you're insured, uninsured, if you're wealthy or not wealthy, if you're Asian, Black, White, Hispanic, all of the above. Everyone can participate in this program and it doesn't matter any status other than 18 and older. 
and you're eligible to come two times in a fiscal year. So if you're already thinking of people who could do this or that you want to promote it to, please, by all means, have them contact us or Tobacco Free Florida, whichever, you know, resource they want to use, whether it be phone, web, group. So they're going to get from the group quit eight weeks of free combination therapy. That can represent hundreds of dollars in over-the-counter patches, gum, lozenges. If you've never looked at the price, pretty much the average price of one box which of patches has 14 patches in there. So a two-week supply is going to be around $50 for a box. The gum and lozenge is similarly priced. So um, to get eight weeks of that presents literally over $200 easy. So remember the Tobacco Free Florida AHEC cessation program is the group quit option, which is managed by Big Ben AHEC. So this, I'm just really using this as a platform to tell you about these free services. There literally is no catch. Um, we do have a provider referral form that the Bureau of Tobacco Free Florida's marketing team created. And this is really more for healthcare providers. So if you can think of like, man, my I've never had my clinical office of whatever, my dental office, my healthcare office, not asking me about tobacco use. And I think that they should because it's a socially conscious thing to do and the ethical thing to do to ask every single person. I am a clinician and I ask everyone, you know, what's your tobacco use? Have you ever used, you know, are you former tobacco user, current tobacco user? And I document that. And if they are a tobacco user, I'm going to try to use tactics like motivational interviewing to help talk them through it and ask them if they want a resource and I'm going to make a referral like this. But uh, you can also just tell individuals about it if, if you're not a clinician or don't have a clinician in mind to share this form with to uh, call the number and that's a self-referral really or just like word of mouth and that's another great way to promote the program. We're currently in the area doing radio advertisements to promote the new virtual platform of cessation classes uh, with Cumulus Radio too. So. We do try to support local whenever we can uh, when it comes to doing any uh, marketing or promotion. So if there are any questions, I can answer those about this form. But they have at the bottom that it would go to the um, in-person or the phone quit or the web, you know, online. So those are obviously, as you can see, the AHEX run the in-person group quit. And then the Optum runs the other two services from Tobacco Free Florida. So we do multiple different training topics and we do have deliverables for cessation um, participants as well as training. So we have to train healthcare professionals and healthcare profession students. Um, so we typically would go into like FAMU, TCC, um, we cover all the way over to Panama City, so Gulf Coast State College, Chipola College, um, Kaiser College, and there's just so many more that we partner with. Um, and we do these different topics. So the brief tobacco intervention for the clinician, motivational interviewing, tobacco and oral health, as I'm a dental hygienist, I do have a specific one to that. Then whatever new trends may happening, and right now specifically um, electronic cigarettes and the pod versions of those, like the products like Juul, and then tobacco use and the effect on fertility. Uh, we did this one for North Florida Women's Care and they just really loved the information shared. So if you're thinking, well, how can I help promote this in my organization? AHEC staff can deliver materials to you. We've been delivering what we call swag bags all over to COVID testing sites. So it's got, you know, flyer about the resources in there and something like, you know, a phone wallet like this that has the number and resource on it. And it just holds like my credit cards and cash on the back. We've got pop sockets, water bottles, balls, things like that. But also um, print material that can be put in a holder in your lobby um, or a poster put up or a flyer, brochure. You know, we've got all of these materials. If you want them, please call or email me and I'll get that sent out to you. So just to wrap up, I did include some references here. And um, this just kind of cracked me up when I saw it in a presentation. So I've left it in all, pretty much all of my presentations. I thought it was funny. Don't throw your cigarette ends on the floor. The cockroaches are getting cancer. <laughs> <laughs> so just got to add a tiny bit of humor. Um, all right. So if there are any questions, I would um, actually I'll stop sharing this now so that we can see each other's faces a little bit better and it's easier to see who's talking. So if there are any questions, I'll take them now.
I've noticed um, with some of the people I work with, the just the price difference among different brands of cigarettes. There's those 305s, which are relatively cheaper than say mm -hmm. um, your Marlboros, Camel, stuff like that. But then I've been told by people who use them that you need more of the cheaper stuff to get the same effect. Is that true? Yeah, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. What I do know is I've had a presentation done to me by a man who used to, actually two different men who used to work in the tobacco industry, and they're kind of what's known as whistleblowers, and now they go around and talk about the things that they did within the industry and that they were asked to do. And one of the things for the cheaper, cheaper cigarettes was that they said that literally was like the leftovers and sweepings from the floor clean back up and put into the cheap products and they call it awful o-f-f-e-l and yep. i thought and that could be that it is you know weaker more kind of like stem byproduct of the tobacco and um it doesn't make it any safer that's for sure um and then it, they're making it slightly cheaper because it is the cheaper product in-house in their factory but also they understand the population that they're trying to target can't afford you know seven eight nine ten dollar pack of cigarettes on the same token and many times you will see those products um in cigars as well the little cigars there, there's a loophole. So the populations that smoke cigars are going to be predominantly minority and they're made cheaper. There's a huge loophole in the fact that only thing that really differentiates a cigarette from a cigar is the wrapper. So the cigar is a tobacco leaf incorporated into the wrapper, uh, which is why you'll see those uh, 305 cigars have a brown paper versus the white paper. And that's just because it has tobacco within it and nicotine in the actual wrapping and leaf. And then you've seen, of course, like Cuban cigars, the big fat ones that have like the big tobacco leaf obviously wrapped around it. So, um, I don't know if I directly answered your question. I rambled on a little extra, but. No, and I didn't know that about the difference between cigars and cigarettes. That's interesting. Yeah, they're definitely not safer many times. One of the differences is not only is it wrapped with tobacco leaf containing slightly more nicotine. They're generally larger for the most part too. So uh, you can be exposed to more nicotine in one sitting. Um, and many don't have a filter, but I don't want to make that sound like a filter makes it safe because that is just a false sense of safety that was incorporated at some point to get people to think, oh, if there's a filter, it's safer, it's healthier. Well, you know what, it's safer to get hit by fewer bullets of a machine gun, but the outcome is still the same. Safer to jump off of a 10 story building over a one story. I mean, you know, you could say that all day and it's still harmful to your body, so. Any other comments or thoughts or questions? And do we still have Miss Joyce on the call, Miss Willis? I wonder, I can't see. I think she's off now. Oh, darn, because she's one of our facilitators. I was hoping she would be able to comment. We've got a couple of uh, team members that join in. Kristen and Yolanda, um, are, they enroll our clients and teach classes. Hey, yo. So um, if there are really no other comments or questions, I want to thank you so much for joining today. And uh, please feel free to get my email or phone number and reach out to Big Ben Day Heck for um, the cessation, if you find that you have a population or a work setting or community that you want us to bring this to where we're not already doing it. Absolutely. And I'll make the slides available as well as the recording. And always, if <clears throat> UPHS can set a part two of this training up for your team members, um, most of you all know how to reach me. Just give me a buzz and we'll make that happen. So thank you very, very much for your time, Emily. This was very, very thorough. Um, I definitely learned a lot. Awesome. Thank you so much. And of course, um, Yolanda, you can reach out to her or Kristen as well. Yolanda's on your UPHS board. Um, so we thank you for including us and uh, we are happy to come back and talk on any subject you like regarding tobacco, opioid, or uh, diabetes in the future. So thank you for your time. Thank you. All Everybody right. have a good day. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.